Hi, everyone. This is uh, Steve Warnick, Rabbi Warnick, one of the rabbis of Beth Sedek Congregation, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Welcome to Conversations Over Coffee, our weekly video blog on interesting topics with interesting people. It uh, started um, a year ago as a way uh, to keep ourselves occupied and interested as we were spending so much time at home. Uh, we're really happy that you're here with us this week as we have a special edition in commemoration of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, uh, which is taking place on Thursday. Uh, today we're talking with Rosette Rutman, one of our members of Beth Sedek, daughter of survivor. Um, her mother and her aunt uh, and really much of her extended family um, has uh, one of the more terrifying um, interesting and important stories of uh, survival and experience during the Shoah, during the Holocaust. Uh, we thought it was an important story for us to hear, especially uh, this week for Yom HaShoah. If you want to find out more about it, we'll mention this book, I'm sure, a couple times uh, during the course of our conversation. But the book is called um, The 999, The Extraordinary Young Woman of the First Official Jewish Transport to Auschwitz. Um, uh, I recently read it, um, and I have to say, um, it's a difficult read. Um, it's a difficult read, but one that I think is essential in terms of understanding the Holocaust, and uh, especially a little known fact um, until recently, and that is that the first official transport of Jews to uh, Auschwitz was a transport of women, uh, 999, 997 actually, um, but 999 women, and um, Rosette's uh, mother, Ella Friedman Rutman, and her aunt, Edith Friedman Vallow, were uh, basically numbers um, 1949 and 1950 on those transports. Uh, Rosette, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, thank you for having me. Good to see you, as always, even yeah. virtually. Um, <clears throat> you know, as we were talking about this before, we, we felt that the uh, place to start is really at the beginning, um, to describe um, your, your family, uh, where they lived, what was life like um, in their town, um, in their country, and, and then to, to go from there. Thank you again for having me. So my mother and her five brothers and sisters grew up in a small town called Kapushani Preshova. Preshova was the larger town in the area, was in the um, middle to eastern end of Slovakia. And uh, they had 40 families in the entire town, 10 of whom were Jewish. They said they got along very well with their neighbors. My grandfather owned a forest and a farm and a slaughterhouse so that people from all over came and brought their, their animals to be slaughtered, uh, Jews and Gentiles alike. They said they got along very well. They had a very comfortable what would, we would call a traditional family. They kept Shabbat, they kept all the holidays, uh, dressed conservatively. But my, my grandmother who became a widow at a very young age was very forward thinking. And um, she believed in educating her daughters and thank God she did because that was a saving grace for all of them. Um, they, my mother always tells the story that in March of 1942, they baked matzah for the first time. And that was because there were uh, restrictions and Jews weren't allowed to mass produce them. So they made their own matzah, but she never knew if her family got to eat the matzah because she and Edith were taken away on this first transport. Um, there was a knock on the door in the middle of the night and it was the Halenka guards. And they said, pack your bags, girls uh, 16 uh, and over, who were not married were to report to the train station and bring one suitcase with your valuables in them. And that was all the information they were given. This is a picture of the family. I have so few pictures, but this is one of all six children. My mother is the oldest standing in the middle. My aunt Edith is uh, the slightly older, blonde, bl more blonde haired child. And then their younger sister, Lily, who came to Auschwitz just three weeks later. Uh, is on the other side of her. Um, I, I think I have two or three other pictures from their youth and that's it. Um, they had no idea where they were going. There were some rumors that they were being taken to work in, 
in factories uh, to help the war effort, but uh, it soon became apparent that uh, it, this was not going to be a pleasant time. They were degraded from the beginning. They were put into cattle cars. They were kept in a, in a large um, school in Poprad, which was the uh, place where the train left for Auschwitz, but they didn't know that. Um, there were no facilities there. They were stripped and paraded in front of SS guards, and they didn't know what was going on. And when this, they had a, this was this was still in Slovakia. This was still in Slovakia. There's actually a um, a plaque at Proprod Station commemorating uh, that they were taken from there. And every year there's an official ceremony involving top officials. And um, Heather Dune Macadam, who wrote the book Nine Nine, actually connected with some survivors' families when she went to one of the official ceremonies uh, in, I think, 2017. Um, but, you know, before we get too far into that, um, one of the really grotesque aspect of this was that the, the Slovaks basically mm -hmm. paid for, paid the Nazis to take, take these Jewish girls. Um, you know, what, what do we know about why that happened and, and why why start with with the girls and you know i mean that's part of what do, doesn't didn't make sense but yet people didn't it seemed like people questioned it but only to a little point is if you're sending people to go work in factories and so forth and so on why are you taking the teenage girls why not the teenage boys so that's a really More good suitable question. for that yeah that's an excellent question and and heather in her book examined that and she she believes it one of the reasons was if you want to uh stop a nation from growing, if there are no women, you can't have babies. So you can't, you can't have a second generation. And she believes that's one of the main reasons. She also thinks that because it was just girls from 16 to 33, nobody was really going to make a big fuss about them because the boys were still needed at home to help in the fields and help support their families. Um, life had been good in Slovakia up until Joseph Tizo took control. My family had been there apparently for several centuries and had done very nicely. Um, so uh, under Tiso, things took a radical change. He was a, a Nazi sympathizer and he did pay, a, and not a small amount for each woman to be taken away. And he paid the railroad for each suitcase and each passenger. So this was not an inexpensive um, uh, project that he took on, but he was such a Nazi sympathizer and he wanted the Jews out of his country. That's why he did it. it, went, it the, his goal was 5,000 5, uh, girls in the first like week or something like that. Um, I know that the Germans were, were into numerology. They were very superstitious and they liked the number 999. The first 999 women in Auschwitz were taken from uh, German and Polish prisons. They were not Jewish. They were uh, petty thieves, murderers, some um, activists. And that's why, even though my mother was in the first Jewish transport, her number is 1950. Um, so the first, and those, the first 999 were those other prisons. Yes, yes. And then, and then the 1000 rate. was a Jewish doctor who insisted on going with the girls when he saw what happened. And then the girls were numbered from 1001. Mm -hmm. And um, my mother and aunt held back. They wanted to see what was going on. And that's why they were among the last 50 to be tattooed in that first shipment of 999. So uh, it, it, some fascinating things about that. But you can understand why it's only girls, right? We still have our sons were OK. There wasn't that much of a ruckus. You take away the girls and you take away the uh, the, the future the future so um, so they're they're in the the transport the the transfer station still in Slovakia and now they're being handed over to the SS so and they were put in cattle cars there was uh, a bucket for a toilet there was no place to lie down they were packed so badly in there and they traveled overnight and arrived in Auschwitz on March 26th, 1942. And they came to uh, an incomplete camp. It was, it was raw. 
And I feel a little bit that that saved their lives because they were needed to um, help construct it and help put things into process in order to keep up with the mass numbers that came after them. Uh, the first few months there, they uh, tore down bombed buildings by hand, removing each brick and, and uh, within a couple of months though, my Aunt Edith got my mother a better job in Canada. Canada was the place where everyone's suitcase that they had so carefully packed was taken from them as soon as they got off the train. And it was taken to this warehouse where some of the lucky girls got to sort through the things. Clothing was sent to Germany and valuables were given to the Gestapo. But my mother didn't steal very much. And my aunt Edith got very frustrated with her. So she approached the office and told them that her sister had beautiful handwriting. And she got my mother a job under Dr. Mengele in the office. And that's one of the reasons I think all three sisters were able to survive as long as they did. With an office job, uh, your hair wasn't shorn at every, every couple of weeks. There was a little bit more dignity in her life. And you were given some extra rations, which she brought back and shared with her sister. Wasn't that late, much later, though? The, the, no, the, they, my mother only worked outside for the first couple of months. And then, and then, then she went to Canada and then, then under Dr. Mengele. And she worked in his office until late 1944. Right. So Canada is what they refer to that detail where they sorted all the clothing. Yes. And, because it seemed. Uh, it was, um, as it says in the book, um, a place far from the strife of war-torn Europe, a country that was still free. So in, in their minds, they named it Canada, I suppose, as one of the ways of maintaining their own sense of protest and liberation. I, I think the Germans named it that, actually. Unless it specifically said that. And it was Canada. And it says that the prison, prisoners began to refer to the detail as Canada. Okay. So. It's hard to admit to, to keep track of all this stuff because there's just yeah, so much so much of it. Right. Um, I know that when we talked about this, we talked about how did how did they survive? And and my short answer to that is they survived because of Edith, the middle sister. Even though she was four years younger than my mother, she was the brains um, and had the determination to try to keep them alive. So she found my mother good jobs. She could have taken them herself, but she didn't. She found um, the younger sister, Lily, and herself jobs cleaning the barracks, but that was considered to be also a plum type of job because you weren't outside in the elements and you got a little bit more rations. They also worked, the three of them stuck together uh, uh, throughout everything. They tell a story that they escaped selection to the gas chamber one day because they had washed their hands and their bodies using one of their cups of very weak tea that they got every morning. So they, they saved one cup to wash and the three of them drank the other two. And uh, there, there were stories of them meaning, just very- Meaning that they, they looked a little bit more- Their hands were clean. A little healthier. Yeah, their hands were clean. Yeah. That's how they escaped the selection that day. That was they, the selections were based on arbitrary decisions. That the, they still didn't escape standing in in lines for hours in the morning and at night and sometimes in the middle of the day, no matter what kind of weather. The the Germans degraded them in any way possible. They weren't supposed to refer to each other by their names. They were supposed to refer to them by their tattoo numbers. Um, when they first arrived, a number of the girls had internal examinations because the Germans were trying to see if maybe they hid some jewelry or something inside. And they would go from one girl to the other and they, there were reports of screaming and, and just them shoving a dirty bloody glove inside one woman and then going and doing it to the next. So, and these were sheltered young virgins. I mean, you couldn't be more sheltered than they were at that point. So. They, they just took away all semblance of humanity that they had. I, I, the other point I was going to make is my mother was really well educated. She was 21 at the time she was taken and she had completed actually a college business uh, course, but she couldn't find a job because she was Jewish. 
she already spoke seven languages at this point or had studied them. And that also made her very useful in the office because she could at that point translate Czech, Slovak, German, Latin, Russian, Polish, and Hebrew. She learned three other languages after the war, Swedish, English, and Yiddish. But she was extremely well-educated and, and that helped her throughout the war. What, um, what did Edith do if Edith kept giving um, Lily and, uh, and your mother? So Edith cleaned the barracks, but she would go, she, my aunt was like, um, Oliver, the, the street urchin in Oliver. She, she was everywhere sh she shouldn't be and everywhere she should be. And she made friends with the guards, she bribed them. She saved Lily's life twice by getting information that one, the children's um, barrack was going to be uh, exterminated the next day. And she uh, got Lily out the back door by bribing one of the capos. And- What did she bribe the capo with? Bread. Bread. Yeah. And then she heard that the infirmary uh, was going to be liquidated and Lily was there. And she, again, got her out of there by bribing someone. So really Edith is the, the reason that they're alive. And my mother spent her entire life trying to repay Edith for saving her. Um, mm. she, she never wavered in her loyalty to her. So it was, it was an interesting upbringing. Uh, having that association with me. Well, one of the things that we, you know, you you kind of um, hinted at it. One of the things that when we think about the Holocaust, you know, we think about six million. We think about the death camps, um, the gas chambers. Um, but the book um, describes in detail people's memories of um, the 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 torturous. Um, uh, torturous, not even lives, but the 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 just the the torture that the Nazis um, randomly um, uh, displayed, um, uh, just the you know the the banality of um, of of behavior to to quote Hannah Arendt um, uh, of that. Um, did did your did your mom or aunt ever did they talk about about that? You know what they they never really burned me. I, I came along quite late in my parents' marriage and um, I, I didn't know a thing, to be honest with you. I knew that we had uh, a different sort of family. We lived with uh, the middle aunt and her husband and her two boys. We lived as one family. Uh, I, I thought everybody might have two sets of parents like I did, but I was lucky enough to be the only girl and I was I, I, they were a little bit better off. They ended up in London, Ontario, if I can backdate the story. And uh, they built a business in the market, if anybody knows London, it was called Vallow's Market Bazaar and Vallow's Fruits and Vegetables. They chose the name Vallow, which was the alias my uncle had lived in uh, under the war. And because it didn't sound Jewish, they were very quiet about their Judaism. Um, but we lived a very rich life. There were about 40 immigrant families in London and they were all extended family. I had aunts and uncles who I would have to explain really weren't my aunt and uncle. Um, when I was six, I had my first clue that something was amiss. Uh, my mother had taken me to the nicest store in London, which was Burke's and told me I could have anything I wanted for my birthday. And I chose a Kaiser figurine of a dancer because I was taking ballet. And uh, to this day, I can see her eyes filling with tears and her telling me, I can buy you anything else in the store, but I can't buy you this because it's German. And that's all she said. And that has stuck with me. I, we don't buy anything German still to this day. I, I know Israel is full of Mercedes or whatever, but that's our personal protest. Um, when I was about 16, I found a draft of a newspaper article for the London Free Press, and it talked about the film and the book Playing for Time. I don't know if people remember that, but it was the story of Alma Rosé, who was the orchestra leader in Auschwitz. And it was particularly controversial because they had chosen Vanessa Redgrave, who was very vocal pro-Palestinian at the time, to play Alma. 
And they interviewed my mother and aunt because they knew Alma in Auschwitz. And that was the very first time I found out that they had been on the first transport. Now I knew that they had tattoos, but so did a lot of my other friends' parents. So to me, that wasn't uh, anything unusual, but we did keep quiet. We didn't wear Magain Davids. We didn't, we weren't flashy about our Judaism. And as I said, the store wasn't called Rutman's because that sounded too Jewish. It was called Valos. So um, my mother only in her nineties really became vocal about trying to tell her story. She did do a, a, a show a tape for Steven Spielberg, but I was very disappointed in it because she looked so uncomfortable and so awkward and she really minimized everything. And she was the family historian. I had, I had great hopes for her tape. Uh, my Aunt Edith's tape, on the other hand, I thought was raw and emotional and told it like it was, but, but staying calm. So I thought it was a much better tape. Mm. But um, meeting, meeting Heather in 2017, and she came to interview my mother and myself and my daughter, that was really the beginning of me delving further into my mother's experiences. And it was very hard reading the book. Um, as I relayed to the rabbi before this, it, it doesn't paint my Aunt Edith in a great light. And I, I literally cried for three days uh, because this woman helped, helped shape me. And here she was portrayed as a thief. And I finally approached Heather about this and she said, well, you know, your aunt said she stole in, in her tape. And, um, and she said, but Edith forgave Edith. They had the same, the, the protractor, the main character in the book is Edith Friedman Grossman. And my aunt was Edith Friedman. And um, when I met Edith Grossman, she said, of course, I remember your aunt. I didn't realize why until I read the book. But I realized that if my aunt had stolen the other Edith uh, package, she shared it minimally with my mother and aunt and possibly with another woman who would become their uh, relative by marriage after the war. So that made me feel slightly better. But my aunt did say that she stole wherever she could to survive. You know, I, I find it hard to judge people in that experience. Um, you know, the whole thing was designed to dehumanize you. And one of the outcomes of that is dehumanization. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and those that are, you know, I mean, clearly was, people make choices to, for self-survival. Um, some, some, you know, at the moment, um, certainly in those moments, I, it's impossible to judge people. Well, I was glad that I finally spoke to Heather about this because she had told me after the meeting with my mother uh, that that she forgave my aunt, that she said, why am I carrying a grudge? We were 16 and 17 years old. We did whatever we had to. But that, and, as you said, they were, they, they, were, they were adolescents. They were teenagers from a very small town. Um, they, they hadn't experienced um, the larger world. And then the larger world that suddenly they're being, being thrust into um, is, is, is a world of evil. Um, you know, I mean, People are gonna, people do, people respond to that with, a, with whatever um, um, strength they have. Um, your, your aunt made some decisions that, you know, um, in normal circumstances certainly would, would be problematic, but in those circumstances saved her life and, and those are the people around her. Um, it's like, I, I just can't imagine. Um, I think you have a picture of, of this is from 1986, but this is um, my aunt and uncle and my mother and father and me. Even when we moved to separate houses, we lived <laughs> nearby. Guess who's who? <laughs> I'm, I'm in between my parents. Yeah. Um, what, what was your, uh, what did your mom, do for, for Mengele, what, what was her job? So because she had such beautiful handwriting, she wrote, wrote the infamous list of names of people who were killed that they initially kept so uh, strategically. Um, 
And when my daughter went to Auschwitz on March of the Living, she sent me a picture of a list, but it was men's names. And she said she only wrote women's names. She said she never looked at Mengele in the face. She was terrified of him the entire time. I bet uh, nobody did. Um, so a question that we received from uh, Facebook is, what is it that is inspiring you to tell your mother's story now? I think she would have wanted it. As I said, towards the end, she was, she was telling people, strangers, in fact, that we met. I think she, she firmly believed that this should never happen again to anyone and that by telling her story and making the world know how evil people could be, uh, that we would try to not repeat the same mistakes again. Uh, it, it's, you know, this is a really strange thing for me to be doing because we always were so quiet about this, but I feel that, that she would be very happy knowing that her story was told and that people could learn from it. What, what have been some of the impacts of, uh, on you growing up as a child, a survivor, especially one whose story um, and experiences um, are so unique and intense? So for one thing, we had to uh, clean our plates. We did not have, we did not leave a single scrap of food around. And my mother even took all of the uh, cooked vegetables out of every Friday night soup and made a cocoa from it. Nothing went to waste in our lives. The other thing is my own personal fear, and I don't think, I don't even know if my mother knew this, is I am terrified of, of large gatherings of Jewish people. I can't go on, on uh, the walk for Israel. I get nervous getting ready to go to shul for the high holidays. I just feel like we're so vulnerable. And this just isn't in Toronto. This was in London, Ontario, where our shul had maybe 200 families. I would be terrified to go to shul for, for Rosh Hashanah because I felt like we were uh, sitting ready to be victimized again. So that to me is, is the largest impact on my life. I've been very lucky. I, I did a, um, a three-person panel in January for the International uh, Yom HaShoah program. And two of the other panelists, their parents also worked for Dr. Mengele. And I'm the luckiest one. Uh, nobody wanted children. My mother didn't really want to bring children into this world. I was a, an accident. But she says in the book, it was the best thing that ever happened to her. But uh, neither did these other two parents. And mine are the only parents who related to me. Uh, the other children who are now adults said they had no relationship with their parents. They couldn't figure out how to cope with another human being. They were so uh, upset about uh, coping with themselves. I don't know if that's the right word, but um, I had the most normal upbringing of anyone. What are, what are some of the enduring lessons that you've learned from your mother and your aunt? Treat people the way you want to be treated was always a family logo. And, I, and you have to make your own good time out of any situation. It's totally up to you what you do with it. Those were the lessons that I learned. And just to be kind. And the other thing that I saw was our home was always open. Um, my, my uncle would come home from Shul, Erev Pesach, Erev Rosh Hashanah, and bring two or three people who had no place to go that night. And I had this overwhelming memory of reshuffling the place settings at the dining room table to accommodate them. And that's something that my husband has allowed me to do, but I'm more practical. I invite them beforehand. There is occasionally some shuffling, but, but it was just always to, always to open your home to others who were less fortunate and especially new immigrants. I saw that modeled all the time. And and what do you what do you want um, what do you want the takeaway to be to people that hear hear the story? I think that we have to we have to model tolerance. We have to learn about people who are different from us, and we have to accept that everyone has their own beliefs, and our beliefs aren't necessarily the right ones. Everybody has a right to believe in what they want to be, but this should never ever happen again. 
And 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 are you worried that that it's possible? Terrified. When when my mother first started with the dementia, she would ask, "Am I dying?" And are they trying to kill me? Mm. Those were the two questions she repeated many times an hour. And uh, when she first started, I would say, mommy, the bad people are all gone. But I couldn't say that towards the end because I didn't feel that way. I think she would have been terrified that something like what happened to her could be happening again soon to someone, not necessarily Jews, but to other people as well as Jews. Um, Rosette, how have you approached Holocaust education with your own children and your own family? Have they taken an interest um, in the family history? They have my daughter. I only have one child and she has, she's been on March of the Living. Um, and she was very affected by that. She said some of her friends weren't, they, it was just a holiday for them. But to her, it was, it was really, her grandmother were in, was in these buildings, in these places where she was walking. Um, the barracks that uh, that your that your that her grandmother was in is that still standing? In yes, my mother drew out a map of Auschwitz before she went in 2012, and told her this is where I worked, this is Canada, and this is where I slept. Hmm. Now she was she she was in Auschwitz and then taken to Birkenau, but she worked in Auschwitz every day. So and um, their story had a, a unique twist to it. They weren't liberated in January from Auschwitz. They had moved to a munitions factory in late 1944, and then were traded for Swedish Red Cross trucks. So they were actually liberated. We celebrated May 1st as their first day of liberation in Sweden. And um, they, my aunt again maneuvered them. She heard that, uh, this was a possibility. Some guards told her, you, you're from the first group, you know too much, you won't be allowed to live. You should get on this transport if you can. And they did. And they, the, Swedish was one of the languages that my mother learned after the war. They lived there for 18 months. And my mother came alone on a Swedish ocean liner from uh, Europe to Halifax. And she was the only passenger who was able to speak with the Swedish crew. I always thought that was hey, a little- your your mom your mom and your aunt your and your aunt were were um, not even sold but they were the the Slovaks paid for them to go to Auschwitz yeah and then the Germans traded them for trucks yes at the end of the war it's like awful I I you know I referred to my mother in her eulogy as a phoenix. She arose from the ashes and rebuilt a lovely life. Uh, she didn't want much here. She never used um, all of her language ability. She was happy. She first took care of my cousins who were young boys. And then I was born 10 years after they were. And she took care of me. She just wanted to be a homemaker. She didn't want to make waves. She just wanted Shalomba Bayit and Shalomba Eretz. She, she just wanted everything calm and quiet. I lost her at 99 in February of, of 2020, just, be, just before COVID. I was able to have a funeral for her here in Toronto and in London. Do you find that eerie that she was part of the, the 999 and you lost her at 99? Yes, a little bit. There's, there's you know, the first day yeah, that I- I don't believe in those kinds of coincidences, but it's like, you can't help but note that. <laughs> but you know what, I, we did a, a premiere, there's a documentary for 999, and our, my school in London uh, hosted the Canadian premiere for it in December of 2020. And I was still saying Kaddish for my mother. And the morning after that, I, I went to where I normally say Kaddish, and there was a red uh, cardinal that sat for about 20 minutes in front of my window. And normally the birds all go to the backyard because there's a bird feeder there. And in some cultures, a red cardinal is a beloved spirit. And I, I truly felt that she was telling me that she appreciated what I did and, and was happy that I was sharing her story. Have you been on March of the Living? Have you been to, to Poland? Uh... I haven't. I, I have wanted to go. Um, I. I would like actually to go to Poprad railway station mm -hmm. uh, 
and uh, perhaps from there on that, I, I, I think that I, I would do it in a smaller crowd. I, I, I think March of the Living is too public. You don't, you don't like you don't like the targets. <laughs> no, no. Well, and it's yes, that too. Yeah. <laughs> right. it's, it's um, I, I'm a very emotional person, and um, I also had I had a volunteer job that that was exactly the time of year where um, I was needed the most, so I couldn't go. But I I I do want to go there. I have been to Theresienstadt. I I I got I was crying at Anne Frank's house because people weren't really taking it seriously. The young kids were just flitting around. Yeah. So I, I can't imagine how emotional I will get when I do go to Auschwitz. With good reason. Um, I wanna just excuse myself for a moment to grab a Sidor because I'd like to conclude by doing the MLA for the 6 million. So excuse me one second. I, I'll use this opportunity. This is the book if you're interested at all. Um, there's some very interesting information about a number of Canadians who ended up in Montreal and in Toronto. And um, Linda is putting the link in the comments for you. Um, it's a very hard read, I'll warn you. And, uh, but it's, it's important to know about these girls. And the author felt that uh, this, was a, this had gained um, popularity because of the role of women being uh, so much more at the forefront today that these young girls were finally finding, getting their say in, in what happened to them. So thank you for listening. Um, thank you for sharing, Rosette. Um, we'll recite now the El Malay Rachmim, the prayer for the departed, the specific version for the six million. El Malay Rachamim, Shochen Bam Romim, Hametzei Menucha Nechona, Taha confea shina, the malot kdoshim utorim, kazoa rakia masirim, lenishmot, kol achena bene Israel, shenit behu ba shoa, anashim, nashim, the taf, shenech neku, vishenis refu. Vishne hergu, Shemas fruet nafsham al kidush Hashem. The God Aden tehe menuchatam. Anna bal harachamim hats tirem beseter canafecha lo lamim. Utsror bitra chaimet nishmo tehem. Adonai hu nachalatam. Vayanuach bishalom al mishkavo tehem. Vinomar. Amen. Exalted and compassionate God, grant infinite rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure. To the souls of our brethren who perished in the Shoah, men, women, and children of the house of Israel, who were slaughtered and suffocated and burned to ashes. May their memory endure and inspire deeds of charity and goodness in our lives. May their souls thus be bound up in the bond of life. May they rest in peace, and we say, Amen. I uh, just want to let our viewers know that there are many opportunities this week to uh, educate yourself about the Holocaust and to participate in Yom HaShoah commemoration services. Uh, to see what's happening at Beth Zedek, be sure to visit us at www.beth-tzedek.org. There are activities that are taking place um, through the Simon, Simon Wiesenthal Center, through the Kinchiski Center for Education, uh, all through UJA Federation, through Jewish, uh, Jewish Agency for Israel, uh, the World Zionist Organization, um, and many, many more. Um, really, all you have to do is Google Yom HaShoah commemoration, and I'm sure you'll get a list of many of the worthy um, worldwide uh, events taking place this week. Uh, Rosette, thank you for being with us. Thank you for sharing your mother's story. Um, and I will um, reiterate what you said. Uh, 999 is a hard read, um, but it's one I think that is um, uh, an essential um, an essential history and, uh, and memoir uh, of the Holocaust and uh, therefore an important read uh, for those uh, that are interested in it. Uh, wanna wish everyone well, um, have a Shavuot Tov, a good week, and we'll see you again soon.